Hello, I'm Yannick Dondelange. Welcome to a monster-length episode of Between the Bars. This time, it's all about Brexit. But before diving into that, have a listen to this. Bach's Allemand from his cello suite number six, played by the French cellist and MCO member Christophe Morin, who is in self quarantine at home in Paris. YouTube clip was dated 20th of March. Now, in late April, Paris continues to live under lockdown, and Christophe continues to perform in his apartment under MCO's hashtag KeepPlay, enriching us with great music, and, along with other MCO members dotted around the world doing the same thing, they show the Marla Chamber Orchestra is alive online, and very much needed in these coronavirus times. Check out MCO Musicians' informal and very personal performances on our website and social media channels. But hang on a minute. Rewind to January 31st this year. Britain leaves the European Union and MCO, as an international touring ensemble, has Brexit uncertainties that revolve around the threat to freedom of movement. Freedom to travel the world and play our concerts. Unrestricted. Who would have thought? just a few short months later, and the freedom to simply leave your house or apartment, let alone your city or your country, is suddenly beyond the reach of so many. Let's look back now to January and listen in not only to what the MCO family has to say about Brexit and travelling. They seem quite keen on establishing rules around fishing, so we might need to change what we are officially on paper. But also time warp back to the late 18th century to experience a little of composer Mozart's own life as a touring freelance musician. I assure you, without travel, one is a miserable creature. And then back again to the present for a quizzical look at the euphoria that surrounded the official Brexit celebrations as 11pm chimed the United Kingdom out of the European Union. Hello and welcome to a very special Brexit podcast of Between the Bars. It's Friday the 31st of January. Uh, We're behind stage in the green room of the internationally renowned South Bank Arts Centre. We have a huge window looking out onto the Hayward Gallery and the Queen Elizabeth Hall, all part of the uh, South Bank Centre, backing onto the River Thames, close to Trafalgar Square. Close by you've got the London Eye and the West End, amongst other things. Simply put, we're in the heart of London, capital of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So in about eight and a half hours time at 11pm, just behind the Houses of Parliament, which is actually just a short walk across the Thames from where we are, there will be a party to celebrate or commiserate, depending on how you feel. The moment the the UK leaves the European Union after 46 years of membership. Marla Chamber Orchestra has a concert here at the Royal Festival Hall in just a few hours, and I've grabbed two of our MCO family members for a little all about Brexit and music chat. Chris Dickin is solo trumpet of MCO, and Mark Parker heads up our communications department, and interestingly, they are also both British passport holders. Welcome, Chris and Mark. Hi. Welcome to be here. 
Before we dive into talking about what the classical music world um, world's perspective on Brexit is, let's have a look at what Britain is saying today in preparation for the, the big leave tonight. We've got some newspapers here. Um, just very briefly, Daily Mail, uh, front page here, a picture of um, White Cliffs of Dover and the heading, A New Dawn for Britain. Here at the Sun, we've got Our Time Has Come with a big picture of Big Ben with the 11 p.m., when, which is the time that we will no longer be part of the exactly. European Union. Big Ben looks beautiful there. Ironically, it's uh, going to be covered up tonight. But in scaffolding. In scaffolding. <laughs> yeah. The Daily Express says, yes, we did it, which is also <laughs> quite clear to the point. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what they did or whether it's good or bad. That's for <laughs> and then you've got a, a little bit more sober here. We've got the Financial Times. Britain bows out of the EU with a mixture of optimism and regret and a whole line of they must be brand new Union Jack flags freshly flying outside. Um, Fresh, hot off the press. <laughs> and the last one, actually my favourite one, is a magazine, I don't know, it's called City AM. I think it's a local business freebie. The headline is It's Been Quite a Ride. And it's got a picture of all the most important people to do with Brexit. Um, I know they're meant to be on a roller coaster, but they almost look like kids in a pram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, all, you've <laughs> exactly. got well, Boris Johnson, Angela Merkel, a whole host of others on a roller coaster ride. It's been quite a ride. There you go. Um, if I flick to my uh, BBC app, because it's always cool to see what's happening online, Austria has just released a Brexit stamp. <laughs> commemorating the uh, the day. It's a picture on this stamp. It's a picture of the whole of Europe, and Britain is sort of highlighted out. So it's much paler than all the other countries. And they've got the original Brexit date, which was the 29th of March, crossed out, and the new date, 31st of January, put in there. So that that's going to be quite a rare stamp. There's a Downing Street uh, reception that Boris Johnson is holding this evening, because he's obviously a very happy man. Uh, on the menu, he's going to have uh, English sparkling wine, selection of canopies, lamb on toast, Shropshire blue cheese, beef, Yorkshire pudding with horseradish sauce, mushroom tarts and roast chicken skewers. Another piece of information, our illustrious concert master, Matthew Truscott, had a party, um, a commiseration party yesterday at his house. He lives in London. He's a British passport holder. He sent out an email to the orchestra saying, as we slip despondently out of Europe, please come, lovely European global universal MCO colleagues, to help us ease the pain at a last-minute emergency party tomorrow at the Truscots for those without a plan. Enough gloom and doom. I want to turn to you first, Chris. Uh, you actually hold dual nationality. So if I said to everyone listening that fish and chips is not your only national dish, but also currywurst. Is that a big enough clue to your other citizenship? That's pretty clear, I think. Um, yes, I took the plunge um, just about a year ago. So got in just under the original uh, Brexit deadline. Tell uh, us how it all came about, your reasons for... Well, I've lived in Germany and played in Germany for a, 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 around 20 years. So I was eligible to, to get uh, German citizenship and... Luckily for the Brits, we can actually hold dual citizenship. So I think it would have been a bigger decision in a way probably to give up British citizenship. Mm. Uh, but the fact I can have both at the moment, unless something changes, uh, seemed like a good idea. So you did it as a direct result of Brexit, one yeah, could say. absolutely. That was the reason. Absolutely. I think at the beginning, a lot of people thought, oh, well, it probably isn't going to happen and maybe nothing will really change. And is it worth going through all the... The, uh, this process, which took How about, long did it take, took about a year in the end. But I know a colleague, a, a British guy living in Germany who, who managed to get it in, in six weeks. Wow. So I think it really just depends on the six situation. Six weeks? Yeah, the thing is, some things, it, it turned out when I, I did study in Germany a little bit, but at that when I was there, I didn't have to do a language uh, course. And it turns out now, now you have to have had, if you're going to study in Germany, you have to have done a basic German language course. So I had to do that. Right. And also this uh, citizenship test, you know, the multiple choice test of sort Tell of us about standard. That. Uh, it's not so bad. I mean, I think it's, it's pretty much the same everywhere. I think they have a, a possibility of over 300 questions, which is also related to your region. So the Bundesland, 
if you're in the south of Germany or the north of Germany, there are certain questions which are related definitely to where you live or where you're based. Um, some of them are ridiculously easy um, and some of them are incredibly tricky. Out of these 300, you have to do only 33 multiple choice questions and I think you have to get 17 right. Um, and so there's an app. So you can just, I spent on many, many travel days, just whipped out the app and sort of bashed through a few questions. During that process, I did it with a couple of German friends and colleagues so occasionally on tour and um, they weren't getting them all right. Uh, there are certain questions you've just got to, <laughs> you've got to just learn them. So really. you knew more than them? Well, hardly, but do you I, feel, I forgot more than that. Do you feel um, like, I don't know, a newly minted sense of patriotism since you, I mean, you've lived there many years. Do you feel... Uh, uh, it's a tricky one. How German uh, do you feel? I should probably say yes in, in case anyone from the German embassy is listening. <laughs> uh, I think, I don't know how I do I, I th One thing I do, as a little aside, what I do like about MCO is because many people in the orchestra do actually live in, a, in another country and not in the where they're born. And whether you, you don't, I suppose we don't really talk about it that much, but there's a there's a definitely a different vibe to somebody if they are living in another country right. because they've gone through all kinds of things, logistical, like new language challenges, living challenges. They everything. have extra perspectives. Different perspectives. And, and that, that, that changes you. So I have this quite a strong feeling that I feel in a way more comfortable of a sorts in terms of logistically getting around Germany. So when mm -hmm. I land in Frankfurt airport, Bremen airport, this you sort of everything, you know, how everything works. I have the feeling whenever I, whenever I come back to Britain, everything's changed again and there's new, you know, they've privatized something and the, you need another train <laughs> ticket and you can't find where, I, I always feel a bit lost uh, in, yeah. in Britain. Although I feel very British, I feel much more British than I do German, but there's elements where I feel more at home right. in Germany because of the, just the nature of living in a place. Do you think you would have got, gone for a German passport even if it wasn't necessary in the end because you've lived there so many years? Pretty clearly no. No, right. Yeah. I don't think that because there didn't seem to be any need. I mean, no. I I could live and work in Germany if the rights were completely the mm. same. Partly because I don't like going through lots of administration things. So I it, it was that was a big. <laughs> You're a musician. I needed to with <laughs> exactly. I needed sort of quite a big kick up the backside to um, actually do it. Yeah. And when you had the sort of the looming Brexit situation, and you had this sort of uncertainty and many people talking it was it was definitely the thing that that pushed me to yeah. do it uh mark can i turn to you now for for a bit um sure. you also live uh and of course you work for marla chamber orchestra in germany in berlin uh but you only have british nationality how's it gonna how's it gonna work for you after 11 p.m when we fly fly to salzburg tomorrow i have been assured and reassured <laughs> and re-reassured that i'll be fine was your was your was the move Brexit related? Because I know you have a German girlfriend. Yeah, it was. Brexit played a part because I uh, I would, I speak German okay, and I'd always held an ambition or an aspiration to kind of to eventually start working in Germany or start working mm. in Austria um, because I know that there's a lot of opportunities there to continue the line of work that I was in, which is orchestras and classical music and everything. So. But what that did was make it real. It makes it yeah. a real, you, have, you, you are confronted with a situation, you suddenly have to make a decision. And it did kind of feel as if, okay, it's now or never. Because mm. I left England on January 27th, 2019, two months before the original Brexit deadline. Okay, since you've been living in Berlin or Germany, uh, has that affected your views or perceptions of Brexit? You must have learned something or... I think what you you, you are have not, a different take on it now. What you're not caught up on when you're outside of that culture is the kind of minutia of everything, because in the run up to my time leading, it was when Theresa May was trying to get her withdrawal deal through, and um, you know you're just it's almost like it's not politics so much as it's almost like watching a wrestling match. It's someone, <laughs> it's lots of different people fighting they over small. They call it contact thing. sports in American politics. I'm sure there was a lot of contact wanted in yeah. some of these discussions, but. It definitely felt, here I am enjoying all these wonderful things. I felt almost very lucky because I kind of must be one of the last people. To get out. To get out <laughs> almost. I don't want to say get out. I mean, no, it's not like I, I don't love England or, where I, or working here. I mean, I lived here for five years in London before 
before yeah. I jump. I don't, you again, jump ship, you know, it's all these escape <laughs> terrible, 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 terrible Exactly. Yeah, I'm ambiently taking in all these um, yeah. celebrity I think it's just headlines. It's, it's the day. It's the last day. We're all a bit emotional. Here, so. Exactly. <laughs> Chris, can I move back to you now? Do you still have musical connections in the UK, old colleagues or old friends? What's your take on their perspective of, of how it's going to be from yeah. now on? I mean, it's a, As a British just musician. a massive question mark. I think, I think the, obviously orchestras, um, particularly probably more London orchestras, do an awful lot of, of European touring. So you regularly see um, orchestras, and Birmingham as well, they're, they're often going over for quick trips to Europe. The little bit I did with um, LSO as well, there were a couple of concerts in Germany, then they were back to London, then a couple of them, one in Belgium, one in, in Rotterdam, then back to London. I mean, it was the, these sort of in and out uh, trips. Very and fast journeys. So like often, yeah. But you three, just, four days and then back for the next program. Yeah, back or home sometimes a day, I think they were doing in and out. And um, I think I just can't imagine what how that's logistically going to work because theoretically then it will be like when, when an orchestra goes to, to the States or, or Japan, if you... Everything that's in the truck has to be all registered, so all the instruments, all the you know, basses, cellos, percussion, whatever mm. they're taking. Um, and it's a very time-consuming, often costly um, thing to do. Um, so just things like that are going to cause problems. And and, if, and the registering if is to do the registering is to do with tolls, customs. Yeah, so customs uh, stuff basically. Right. Uh, so that that will be a question mark. I can imagine, I don't, not so much maybe with orchestras, but you hear about sort of the, the pop band scene. Obviously, they, they'll, quite a lot of things they'll do will be to sell CDs at concerts. Um, mm. You know, people, you say people don't buy CDs, but apparently most CDs are sold at concerts rather than in yeah. shops. Mm. But they won't be allowed to um, carry CDs over anymore. Um, or you'd have to declare everything or you'd have to pay. Just the paperwork and the logistics are going to be tricky where i see a problem i have quite a lot of friends or you notice people in sort of in the the early music world actually because um i think it's more common for british players to go over and guest in um, um european baroque ensembles right or early music ensembles it's a much more fluid situation i i saw on 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 Lovely Facebook. Just this morning, a, a, a viola player wrote a very passionate, long right. um, thing about how how devastated she is. And I mean, I think there will be a there could be real implications because there's a big chance that they will it will be too complicated for European ensembles to to book British players anymore. So that I think there's wow. a big big chance that um, the freelance world, so the this it probably maybe in a mi- minority in many sense, but the I think they, they could potentially suffer or they're going to have to um, do a lot more of the costs as, as individuals. I mean, I guess we'll have to see um, exactly what system is developed. We have the we have this year 2020 where everything will continue business as usual mm. uh, till the end of the year. It's kind of a grace period or something like that. But then it depends what kind of visa system I suppose they'll develop. If they'll If you have to have a separate visa for each country or if they can have a kind of a, I don't know, a one-year European visa work pass mm. for people who have to have meetings. It's not only in the music world, it's it's all different uh, business worlds. Yeah, no one can predict that. That's the worrying yeah. part, isn't yeah. it? They seem quite keen on establishing rules around fishing, so we might need to <laughs> change what we are officially on paper. Mark, can I ask you, um, you haven't been in the MCO family long. You came fresh from the South Bank, uh, the South Bank Centre team in London, where, yeah. you, where you used to work. Um it's a hugely important flagship art centre um, for London and the UK. It's a super international artists from around Europe and the globe pop in to perform and influence London um, uh, and the whole of uh, the UK. What conversations were you having about Brexit when you were working there? What's on their mind? I can't speak for the South Bank now, but certainly when I was there, there was a question of, say, an American orchestra coming over to do a European tour would they still perhaps be able, like they're playing with the San Francisco Symphony later this season. And um, I guess there was a question of, well, if there's all of a sudden all this extra red tape that they have to go through to them play in England, will that restrict the number of players, uh, the number of orchestras Mm. that Mm. can come and play here? And Mm. it's these very kind of open-ended, 
almost business like. It's logistical. Because it's um, it's me. It's primarily logistical. Because I think logistical. I think the artists that want to play here want to play here. Yes. The question is whether or not it would be viable. South Bank Center always saw itself, and rightly so, as one of the many top notch concert halls and art centers across Europe. Mm. So a lot of the German orchestras that come through, um, when I, in my time here, we had the Gewandhaus Orchestra, we had the Berliner Philharmonica, the Goetzenich Orchestra is coming here. Um, we would, this would still be a destination on their European tour. Yeah. And now they would have to, it would be a kind of third party destination. Right. I don't know. Well, lots to think of concerning the future of touring musicians in Europe. Chris and Mark will be back to discuss personal data, fake news, and being a child of the EU-UK divorce. But let's first take a look back at travel through Europe and what that was like for one of history's most famous freelance composers. For Mahler Chamber Orchestra, January 2020 was the month of Mozart. Along with legendary pianist Mitsuko Uchida, we revisited some of the cities Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart composed and performed his music in. Let's dive back in time now, and with the help of travel letters written by Wolfgang and his father Leopold, Take a small peek at what travelling life would have been like for a touring musician in Europe about 250 years ago. Mozart's Europe was that of the 18th century, one dominated by intellectual philosophical movements in the areas of science, humanities, music and the arts, coupled also with a growing lust for travel. The magic of steam locomotion for the masses would not happen till the next century, the industrial 19th, and airplanes were but a distant science fiction not invented till the 20th century. Mozart's century was the final golden age of the horse and carriage. This was a time when young men, and all too rarely women, of influence and means, standing and education, were launched into Europe. The Grand Tour, as it was dubbed, enlightened their understanding of other societies, countries, cultures and ideas, and returned these privileged young adults home with the elixir of knowledge. And knowledge is power. Mozart himself pens a typically indulgent opinion on this. I assure you, without travel, at least for people from the arts and sciences, one is a miserable creature. A man of mediocre talents always remains mediocre. May he travel or not, but a man of superior talents, which I cannot deny myself to have without being blasphemous, becomes bad if he always stays in the same place. The Mozart family were not particularly rich, but had instead a musical genius in Little Wolfgang who, for the world of classical music, would become an 18th century version of Michael Jackson. Prolific, rebellious and terrible with money, Mozart lived only until he was 35. But with a genius-spotting father, Leopold, patriarch of the family and maybe one of the earliest examples of a talent manager, young Wolfgang travelled to be heard. Mozart spent no less than 10 years, or nearly a third of his life, travelling, paraded around the rich and the royal of Europe's kingdoms. He would improvise on the keyboard, present compositions, enlighten the royal courts, and generally attempt to impress money from noble folk. Mozart was one of the first independent travelling freelancers in music history, and pushed sometimes gladly, sometimes not, by his father and his gift, he worked at a feverish pace. A founding member of our Mahler Chamber Orchestra, like myself, has been on tour for maybe a total of seven and a half years of their adult life, and I'm 48. By the time poor Wolfgang reached the tender age of just 18, 
he'd probably already been on the road nearly as many years as me. Mozart's father writes, I doubt if anyone in Salzburg will recognize Wolfgang any longer. We've been away a long time, and since then, he has seen and got to know many thousands of people. And so, what was it like to travel from Salzburg to Munich, London to Amsterdam, Verona to Naples? Today, on an MCO concert tour, Salzburg to Munich takes about 90 minutes in a fast, air-conditioned train. But back then, it was more like two to three days. And that's if all changes of horses went to plan. Today, easy transportation, such as electric scooters and bicycles, take you around town at about 25 kilometers an hour. But horse-drawn coaches covering the major national routes in Mozart's time averaged just eight kilometers an hour. Leopold comments sarcastically. We were planning to leave on the morning of 23rd October. But as it is the delightful custom in Vienna that the post horses generally arrive half a day late, it wasn't until the afternoon that we got away. In 1762, the Mozart family travelled with young six-year-old Wolfi from their provincial hometown of Salzburg to the great imperial capital Vienna. Costs of travelling would have accumulated with every day on the road. The food, the lodging, the transport, but also protection from the highwaymen. One might think back with a romantic nostalgia to the swashbuckling age of the highwayman, but the reality for any traveller in the 18th century was terror when a gun fired outside a carriage and a deep dread that money and valuables may not be all that the highwaymen were after. The horse carriages themselves often had no suspension and rode on wheels of steel and wood across treacherous dirt tracks. There was no air conditioning, no modern insulation, no drinks and food trolley, and no Wi-Fi connection to the world. In the summer months, travelling was unbearably hot, and in the winter, freezing cold. Plus, the men who drove the coach and horses hydrated like most people in those days, not with water, but with beer, wine and spirits. Still, for such troubadouring souls as the Mozarts, long journeys also offered interesting chance social meetings and space for the mind to wander. When I'm travelling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that ideas flow best and most abundantly. Time maybe to put the smartphone finally away. So, travel musicians did, and England, and especially London, was one of those places you just had to be seen. Ideas exchanged, philosophies discussed, techniques studied. The year Mozart died, composer Joseph Haydn was famous throughout Europe. And, aged 58, no mean feat in those days, he decided to travel to the Metropole London. Haydn lived and worked there for more than a year, composing some of his most famous works, the London Symphonies. He was so celebrated that the King of England, at that time George III, even offered for him to live at Windsor Castle if he would stay in England permanently. Composer Felix Mendelssohn travelled across the English Channel no less than 10 times in his short 38-year lifetime. Frederick Handel, the German-born Baroque master. He did actually settle finally in London. It took him two years to get a British residence permit and 17 years before he became a naturalised British citizen. Handel reached such extraordinary fame that he was laid to rest alongside England's kings and queens in Westminster Abbey. Even young Mozart lived for more than a year in London. A travelled, seasoned, eight-year-old Wolfgang performed his musical improvisations, or tricks as they were sometimes called, for everyone, from ordinary paying public in the living room of his modest lodgings to King George III and his Queen Charlotte at the Queen's Palace St. James Park. Leopold Mozart 
one last time. We were walking in St. James Park. The king came driving past with a queen, and although we were wearing different clothes, they still recognized us. The king opened the window, leaned out, and laughing, greeted us and especially our master Wolfgang. Well, London still is one of those places a musician should be seen and heard. In the 90s, when I was studying there, you could see artists, soloists and ensembles from around the globe bringing their creations to audiences any evening of the week. Our students used to say London was the international terminal of the classical music world, a homage to our present age of travel. And how far humans have come since the golden age of the horse and carriage. Not many aeroplanes flying at the moment. Back to Chris now, and the question of getting a visa for a tour that never actually happened. Chris, yeah, let's talk visas now. Oh, lovely. Yeah, we all love a good visa. Going to perform in a country outside the EU usually includes the need for a work visa to allow it to happen. Um, You're used to this as a member of Marla Chamber Orchestra because we perform all around the world, of course. After the Brexit, depending, as we've been discussing, what agreements might happen between Britain and, uh, and the EU regarding freedom of travel, a visa or a form of visas might what is might might what be needed uh, for a British ensemble or performer uh, to perform in any uh, European country. So to the nitty-gritty, um, as it is now for us in MCO, can you describe to us the procedure for getting, let's say, a visa to go to play in Carnegie Hall in New York? Um, mm, yeah, well, we're just we're off to Carnegie Hall in March. That's right, so you're, um, you're in the repeat, middle of it. Repeating this uh, the program we're playing tonight, basically, I think, or, or pretty yes, much no, exactly, exactly this program. the same program. Yeah. And yeah, so you every day at breakfast you see the next sort of groggy eyed person who said, "Oh, I've just been doing my visa form," and and <laughs> and because I, I did it when we were in Spain, I started doing the the visa form, and it took three and a half hours in God. the hotel room three and with and a half dodgy hours. internet, and you're supposed to upload a photo, and it wouldn't accept it, and then it goes on, then you it's just it's a bit of a nightmare to be honest. And um, and many many questions. Yeah, many and many, many questions. Many unusual questions as well. No? Quite often, the big change now this year that, that we, we everyone, some people are freaking out about was you have to actually say you know all your email addresses that you you currently have or use, the social and media also accounts. social media. There was yeah. a sort of pop down box of some some social media things I've never even heard of. But uh, <laughs> but even YouTube, you have to say, do you use? What? Have you ever uploaded anything on YouTube? Uh, are you, you know, are you on Facebook? And you had to give your username, no password, but username of Facebook, for example. Mm. So theoretically, if someone wanted to or, or look uh, search, they could they could kind of have a look at what your what you're what about, your posting what your maybe, or what are. you. Uh, so that that feels like a quite a, a new mm. change. That's that's new this year, and it makes um, the whole process longer. Yeah. This means it takes much longer to exactly. Get it done. It's pretty miserable to be Do honest. Do you have to go and have an interview? Yes, everyone has to go to um, the U.S. Embassy. So in Germany, for people in Germany, you can choose Berlin, Frankfurt, Munich. Mm. But for me, for example, coming from where I live near Bremen, Oldenburg, um, I can't get there on time for a morning interview. So I have to travel the night before. Yeah, exactly. um, I have to then have a hotel. Do the costs, do the costs, costs, cost, 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 which are, mm. you know, and time because that's that's something we don't get we don't get paid for, of course. So and the price of the visa itself, I mean, I don't know how much a German one is. The Swedish one, I had to go through the same process in Sweden. It's uh, a hundred and ninety euros. Yes, yeah, about that, hundred and eighty euros. Yeah, and this, um, and it's it's interesting to remember that these visas are for the process is exactly the same if you travel for one day to the USA to do one concert or for two weeks or four weeks, mm. 
it doesn't matter how how small the period of time is you're there. You mm. have to go through this entire process. Yeah. Imagine if it's going to be like that uh, or close to that or even halfway towards that, yeah. actually. Mark, social media yes. and Brexit. You deal a lot with um, how MCO talks, how it expresses itself to the outside world. I'm not talking about our concerts and our performing, talking about our social media channels. You administrate them and you develop them. Yeah. MCO's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, yeah. for example. So you must have a fairly good understanding uh, of how narratives are used or even invented to influence a person's perception. Do you think the Brexit story has been, I, I don't know, hyped, influenced on social media or in the media in general? Of course it has, but I don't think Brexit is unique in that regard. We've seen how these platforms have allowed un unrivaled distribution of misinformation, of distorted realities, mm. of um, malicious content, and how they're taking barely any responsibility for it. I mean, mm. we all, if you read what Mark Zuckerberg said in front of Sen the Senate in the US. Mark Zuckerberg, this is the, is the CEO, CEO and founder of, of Facebook. Of Facebook, yeah. He effectively de defended his decision to allow content that wouldn't, for example, get past a traditional advertiser because it broke standards of truth and accountability mm. because they have this non-interventionist stance. I think it's very easy to blame these social media channels, I think, because it's a new technology and it really is shaping how we consume news, how we talk to each other, how we perceive of what the, convers the wider conversations. I think that's a big thing is mm. the algorithms are designed to get you to a place in the system that they think you want to be in. And what that does is almost like a funnel. You know, in the past, if you were just flicking through channels on mm. TV, you might come across a completely different perspective. The possibility, I think, was higher to come across these other perspectives. This idea about getting Brexit done, for example, that's a catchphrase that sticks in people's minds. I mean, that is the Daily Express headline. Yes, mm. we did it. This is Brexit. It is done. Well, it's not really. No. We've still got another. We've still got another eleven <laughs> months of trade true. talks. Yes, you know we've still and trade talks are not something that you sign and then it's done. They evolve. They change. Is social media simplifying arguments? Because I often think that um, actually solutions are very complex. What su what succeeds on social media is rapidly digestible content and ideas, and when you have, like you say, complex issues that are being talked about and distributed through these channels, the messages that get spread, the messages that do well, the messages that get responses that fuel the algorithm, that fuel the people who mm. are contributing to this ecosystem are the rapidly digestible ideas. And um, I think there's a, this is part of a wider trend where we think that uh, if, if you can make an idea simple, that's necessarily better. And I think that's part of a general tech mentality, which is good. It's always good to think where's the slack and how can we make this more efficient? But for example, I'm not a physicist. And so if someone was to try and simplify quantum physics for me, I'm pretty sure they'd be leaving a lot of stuff out. I wouldn't mm. take it as a given that that's what it was. And I think what we saw with Brexit and what we've seen with elections recently across the world is this idea that the simplification represents the complex issue. It's it's difficult to say that the result was, because of one way or the other, was a direct result of social media. It's just that these are now prevalent parts of our lives and they are changing how we interact and think about ourselves as part of a wider community, which is has shared ideas or not. The same thing that people have been saying about social media, they've been saying about TV 40 years ago, and they were mm. saying about newspapers. Mm. 50 years before that and before that I'm sure whoever delivered messages on the back of a horse was being told that he was delivering misinformation I mean we need time to adjust to it listen let's let's finish off by thinking to the future I feel having Swedish I have Swedish and British nationality now um, I feel a bit like a child whose parents are kind of divorcing <laughs> you know you've got no power over this it's their decision um but you really want them still to be friends at the least. So what do you two wish for the future of your parent countries? What would, what would you ideally, what would your big dream be for the, to see the future relationship? Well, I suppose the, the people who believe in Brexit, they, they see it as a chance for a better chances for Britain. But they've, they've put cast a shadow on all the, all the ideas of the freedom of movement and the understanding that the, mm. the European Union had. I suppose I hope that 
both sides will get what they want. I mean, may, maybe it's, of course, we don't want, we don't want, I, as a Brit, I don't want the Britain to be weaker. I mm. mean, from the outside, many people feel as though maybe it is now or will be, but um, who knows what's going to happen. But I just hope that they will find new ways of keeping the positive side of the European Union, mm. the freedom of movement, the understanding between um, different groups, even like the European Union uh, Youth Orchestra, which was in London now is, is moved to, to Italy, yeah. to Ferrara, where we, we spend a lot mm -hmm. of time, well, spend some time. Um, these kind of decisions, we don't, I, what's going to happen to the British, the, the um, EU YO had an awful lot of British uh, players yes, in it. it. Uh, how will that affect them? Is that And that, for many, one of the most important things for young musicians is to do these youth orchestras. I mean, mm. I didn't do Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra, but that's where MCO started mm. and um but everyone who's ever done a, who's ever played in a youth orchestra and done these summer festivals it's it's life-changing i just hope that that there's a way for them to keep that connection that connection that's what i would With hope Europe. for the most yeah. mark as a child of brexit what do you wish for your parents in the future i like this analogy of the parents because not yet a or I'm not a German citizen, so I don't know what, does that make me adopted by them? And if so, I hope they don't do a Harry Potter and put me under the oh. stairs. Oh, yeah. Well, you know. I, I think Germany will be a better parent than that. <laughs> quite they seem, time, they seem quite yes. responsible. <laughs> <laughs> I just want the best for England. Yeah. You know, we talk about a lot of opportunities that existed that are going away or that might be difficult to achieve in, in the future. I hope that there isn't a diminishing of Britain and its place and its ability to thrive and the ability of the people in it to thrive and the ability for it to contribute to global European issues. I guess that, that's really it, you know, like I don't, I, and I want that to be across the board. I want it to be a thriving place. Mm. Um, and for music to be able to travel. For music to be able to travel. Around, be for, performed, be composed. For the people in the UK to have access to great music from Europe. Um, and you talked about 30 years from now. I mean, anything could happen in 30 years. Mark, Chris, I want to say a huge thank you thank for you. coming Thanks in very much. to speak Pleasure. today. On this last day of um, Britain being in the EU, we're going to have a fantastic concert Absolutely. this evening. Thank you. Let's Thanks do it. A lot. Thanks. Oh, green button. It doesn't look good, does it? Push the green button. Seriously? Seriously. You mean too? Yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mati, the stage manager of the Marla Chamber Orchestra. And the footsteps you just heard, that was Yannick and me, running down a backstage staircase of a famous venue, right after our concert. We found an exit and stepped outside into a mild Friday evening, facing a big river, ready to go to the most peculiar kind of party I ever went to in my life. Yannick took a last look back on the building we just had left. What's remarkable about this building is um, it was built in 1951 for the Festival of Britain. It was actually to celebrate only Britain, a kind of a pick-me-up after the Second World War for all the pain that the um, British people have been through. So it was not designed to be international at all. It featured British talent, British architecture. It didn't even feature the colonies that uh, England still had at that time in 1951. And the first concert as well, the very first concert in this building that we just played in, was obviously an all English program at the opening ceremony of the building that the royal family came to and uh, many politicians. I think there was Elgar's music, the music of Vaughan Williams, um, Handel. Um, but the second concert, was uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which uh, people ironically know now is the official um, anthem of the European Union. <laughs> and we skip forward to now, and it's part of no less than the South Bank Centre. And I don't think you can get a more international art centre on the planet than the South Bank Centre. So what started off as a very British celebration became a truly international hall. Kind of the rest is history. By now, I'm sure many of you can guess where we were. The building was the famous Royal Festival Hall in London, right in front of River Thames. We had just finished 
A wonderful concert with pianist and Londoner by choice, Mitsuku Uchida. The orchestra was supposed to have pizza around the corner and drinks together, but Yannick and me, we had a different plan. Just a short walk away from the venue, on the other side of River Thames, next to the Houses of Parliament, there was supposed to be a huge crowd celebrating and counting the minutes. It was the 31st of January, and in less than one hour, at 11 p.m., Britain would officially leave the EU, and we wanted to be there too. Not to show support, but to witness this moment in history. When we started heading towards Westminster Bridge, the atmosphere just felt like any other Friday night. People were out having fun, drinking, taking a walk, enjoying the evening. No way to tell that in a couple of minutes the history of this country was going to change. On our way to the Brexiteers party, Yannick spotted another famous building. Interestingly, where we are now, Just across the Thames here, that huge building in front of you, the office blocks you can see, is above a Charing Cross station. Charing Cross station, ironically, um, was the centre of uh, steam train travel to Europe in the mid-19th century. It was designed to um, take train boats, the trains literally went on the steamboats, to Europe and took people around Europe and vice versa, people who wanted to come to England, they came streaming in on these trains into Charing Cross. So it was designed to really try and put London at the center of Europe, you could say, because in the mid 19th century, steam travel was the future. So that station was the hub of most uh, passenger movement to and from England into continental Europe. Let me tell you about Yannick. You know him already. He's a viola player of the Mala Chamber Orchestra and he's also the host of this show. And he's a Londoner, although he lives now in Sweden and even has a Swedish passport. He's really international, but that's what defines London, right? As we continued walking, we could see a bigger crowd gathering in front of us. No, not the Brexit party yet. So here we're coming to the London Eye. Which, describe what it is. Long yeah, it's night. like a massive bicycle wheel. When it was built, it was built for the Millennium Celebrations 2000. Um, and I think it was the, the largest Ferris wheel or... Um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a big wheel that you go up in, in these pods, they're called. It's a glorious um, construction. And if I tell you that the hub of the wheel, so the center of the wheel, was built, was built in the Czech Republic, The uh, spokes of the wheel, so the wires that connect the, if you imagine, if you could visualize in your brain a bicycle wheel, the spokes were made in Italy. Uh, the uh, frame of the wheel itself <laughs> comes from Holland. Uh, and the ball bearings, because all you know, wheels have ball bearings in them to make sure they run smoothly, all the ball bearings come from Germany. The steel was pressed in England. So, <laughs> so I don't think you could get a more To be honest, you couldn't get a more European project than that. <laughs> and, and it's here, slab in the middle of London. Should we move yeah. on? We move on. Have you ever been on this Ferris wheel? Yes, I have. Once, it's great. It looks like a place to, yeah. for, it's a, for dating I, when you were young. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can have honeymoons, you can get married on it. It's like a been an extreme swing and political Well, there you go. There was a, we've just passed A couple of people with uh, Union Jacks on their head, so they're... Well, fairly young people. Yeah, I know, yes. Does that surprise you? I think the whole Brexit issue is so complex that nothing surprises me. Now we're coming up to Westminster Bridge. It's the bridge that um, goes over to Parliament. So when you see often London on television, you have Big Ben, this huge clock. And Big Ben is actually standing right next to the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Bridge is right there. How you get, that's how you get across the Thames. So that's where we're coming to. So we can see Houses of Parliament. We can see Big Ben, which is in scaffolding because it's being renovated. And now we have a, have a very good view on, on the skyline of it's London. Spectacular huh? sky, all of that sky. When we stepped onto Westminster Bridge, everything was still pretty quiet. What a surprise. The only sign of a Brexit party nearby were the police cars and the fog that suddenly was filling the air 
like at a cheesy rock concert. And there's a police car. A police car um, having problems there. <laughs> having problems with the motor, or they have a like a how do you call it? Not a, a good machine. machine. Yeah. Maybe they want to add some mysterium. <laughs> they, they want to choke everyone with their carbon monoxide. I think he's just broken down on Westminster Bridge, which is not a great thing for a police van to do. Shall we uh, yeah. head towards the music? Yes. <laughs> it's like police everywhere. I'm just waiting to be stopped because I have a viola on my back. Well, in this part you have to see that Yannick looks a bit suspicious with his viola <laughs> in the back, especially in the fog of the police car. Yeah. <laughs> we pass Big Ben and sudden... So we're at Westminster Station now and it's really starting to heat up. Lots of Union Jacks. Wake me up before you go go. That's Wham. Okay, they're playing Wham at the Brexit party. Wake me up before you go. -go. Wake me up before you go go. The square just behind the Houses of Parliament was packed. Hundreds of people shouting, drinking. On a huge video screen, everyone could see the man who now was getting ready to address the public. Nigel Farage, the leader of the Brexit party, was about to have the moment of his life. Well, we did it was not the exact reality. It was still a few minutes before 11 p.m., but the crowd started to get really excited. I was fascinated by all the possible ways people were showing their Brexit support. Self-made Union Jack hats, buttons, belts, capes, face paints. One man was waving a huge Union Jack attached to an XXL broomstick. It looked like he'd want to plant it on a new planet. But what surprised me most was to see so many young people around. Not the typical Brexiteers I had expected. <laughs> Sorry guys. May I ask you a question? Are you from London? Are you yeah. English? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, you're, you all look fairly young. You're around 20, I we are. guess. Yeah. Um, is this a historical moment for you? Do you feel... It is. Indeed. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I think, on a long-term perspective, to be able to say that I like lived through this moment is going to be very important. And is it a happy moment for you, or mixed emotions, mixed, mixed feelings? Emotions, Do you know what? Yeah. Uh, But I'm definitely telling my grandchildren about that. Yeah. 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 Like us, these youngsters were here to witness the historical moment more than to show support. The electronic version of Big Ben started the countdown. The leaf was only a few chimes away. seems to be. There's something written on the screen, I can't quite... Ah, oh, the national anthem. <laughs> How do you feel? Excellent. Yeah, did you yeah. enjoy the celebration? Ex amazing. Your last, your last word to the European Union for the day. Last word? Bye. Bye bye. Au revoir. C'est la vie. How do you feel today? Right, man. Yeah? yeah. How do you feel? I feel mixed. I'm observing, let's say. Do you have a last word to the European Union? Right, well, I'll tell you what, we'll all work together and it'll be happy, right? All right. We'll get there. Let's do we'll that, okay? There. Promise. That's what we're going for. Promise. <laughs> Do you have anything like a last comment to the European Union for tonight? Uh, we hope for a prosperous future with you guys. Together? Yeah, yeah together. together. Great. Together.
together but separately. Together but separate. No, no, we, we, uh, both, we both vote we both, leave. Yeah, we both vote we, leave. But we, we hope, we, for our own reasons, we don't want to be part of Europe, European Union. Yeah, and I hope that the rest of your countries all have some sense and follow suit. Time to go. The party was over. People took word and started to leave soon. We walked direction Charing Cross Station, our heads full of thoughts. What a strange party was that. I think it's a shame we didn't get to catch any Remainers. We crossed Thames River via Hungerford Bridge and found ourselves back at the South Bank Center. The guitar player that you heard in the beginning of our Brexit walk still was there, on the same spot, still playing. Let's call this Remainers music. It felt like nothing had changed on this side of the river. We stopped to listen for a while to his beautiful sound, the perfect soundtrack for our mood. While I was trying to visualize one star less in the European flag, I could feel that Yannick was struggling much more with what he'd witnessed today. One is kind of surprised that people don't look sort of more sad or depressed or... But I don't think the implications of Brexit will be felt at all, obviously. Nothing this year will happen. This is a transition year. All rules and regulations basically mostly stay the same for the whole of 2020. So no one's going to wake up with a big hangover in that respect tomorrow. And they might think, oh, we got away with it, everything's okay. But come, come next January, when the rules do change, let's see how it's going to be. We definitely needed a drink now. And what could be better than to have it with our colleagues? our international family, who were still around the corner, waiting for us to join. Matthias Mayer capturing beautifully the sentiments of our Brexit walk along the Thames. Next episode of Between the Bars will, I'm sure, focus on the coronavirus times we're living through. The MCO office in Berlin is on reduced hours, with everyone working from home. All our musician members, soloist partners and conductor partners are holed up wherever their home address is on the planet. And the world of performing arts waits for a signal that they may step once again on stage, in front of a live audience, and communicate. Feelings, emotions, insights, energy, physicality. The internet is a fantastic tool. Stream a concert, listen to a podcast, catch a YouTube clip. It's all out there in the virtual library. But as weeks turn to months and nature moves to spring, staring through a flat screen at a cherry blossom, or listening into a couple of electronic boxes to a violinist's journey through a Bach partita, well, for the moment... The journey is in our minds, our hearts, and our iPhones. And I guess that's okay. Musicians are patient. You tend to be if you've been honing your skills in a practice room from a very early age. So we will wait for that signal. We will step on stage, and along with our audience, we will once more communicate. And the rest will have been history. A special thanks for their artistry and talent in this bumper length Between the Bars episode must go to MCO cellist Christophe Morin and his Allemand from Paris, my daughter Alison Boyd on de and MCO violinist Christian Hoibus, who were the voices of Wolfgang and Leopold Mozart, Takt Eins, as always, for recording our concerts, and the MCO violinist Stephanie Bobin from Vienna, who you hear playing Bach's Partita No. 3.
I would like to also thank from us all at MCO, the people around the world who've donated to our hashtag keep playing campaign. You are the ones making it possible for the Marla Chamber Orchestra to financially survive the corona crisis. Between the Bars podcast team is Mark Parker, Matthias Mayer and me, Yannick Dondelanger. Goodbye till next time. And don't forget, keep listening. Between the Bars.